All righty, our next speaker is Claire Boyles, and the topic of her talk is When Prudes Talk About Sex. So if we would have been thinking, the next one would be When Sluts Talk About Abstinence. <laughs> Write that down, somebody, for next time. Right. Claire loves her family, kale, well, there's a theme for you, old books, and giving confessional speeches to large crowds. One of those things is a bald-faced lie, and I'm thinking she doesn't love her family. <laughs> Welcome, Claire. Well, I'm Claire, and I'm a prude, and I'm here to talk about sex, and I am very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> I'm terrified of this, mainly I think because I was raised by parents so uncomfortable with the topic of sex that they left the entire thing to nuns and priests. So all of the information I got about sex as a child was delivered by people who are famous for not having any. <laughs> and I need to get better at this. The stakes are high. These are my children. They are growing up. They have questions. They deserve good answers. And I'm not the only parent that struggles with this. I think the world would be a little bit better if we could all just open up. So before I tell you about the awful se oh, okay. <laughs> before I tell you about the awful sex talk my mother gave me, let me just preface this by saying she's a great mom. She was really stressed out and this was an off day for her. <laughs> also, she's one of nine siblings, all of whom confirmed that the sex talk they got from my grandparents was complete nonsense, full of disconnected references, vague references to flowers, possibility of disease and sacraments. She didn't have a lot to work with. <laughs> she also started a little too late. <laughs> she was flustered by her accurate suspicion that I was having sex at a precocious age. <laughs> and while we were waiting for my siblings to finish band practice, she turned to me in the car and said, if you get pregnant, you, I will make you keep that baby and it will ruin your life. And we never talked about sex again. So then I had the nuns who were really well-meaning. And their talks had a little bit of anatomy and a whole lot of miracle. Miracle of conception, miracle of childbirth, and miracles are beautiful, but they are not instructive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The other thing the nuns had was a lot of marriage talk. Sex is important for marriage. Sex is exclusive to marriage. And the nuns told me all the time that they were married to God, and that was confusing and gross. <laughs> so we had a seven-week honeymoon in Central America. We had sex. We don't talk about it, but we have it. And we spent a week with a family in Nicaragua, a family of coffin makers. And they built us a room to live in with three wooden walls and one wall that was a curtain that was a door. And one morning they brought home from the market wrapped in newspaper fish heads and vegetables, and they turned it into a really strange lunch where there were two bowls of soup on the table, one for me and one for my husband. And then the entire family, 25, 30, kind of spread out behind us and watched us eat it. And we didn't speak a lot of Spanish, but we knew they were making fun of us because the ladies were kind of standing behind Matt looking at me going, hee hee hee, gemelos, gemelos, which means twins. <laughs> and the men were standing behind me looking at Matt going, fuerte, you know, like, which means like strength. And the big reveal is that this was special fish head fertility soup that they had prepared because we were on our honeymoon and because we were done eating it, they took us to the bedroom, closed the curtain, stood giggling outside of it and said, get to it, make some babies. <laughs> and a honeymoon or no, we just could not make that happen. <laughs> so instead we just looked at each other like, how long does it normally take us to like finish? <laughs> and do we need to make noises? And I don't know what to do. This is uncomfortable. <laughs> the truth is, though, I'd rather be kind of Nicaraguan and goofy and upfront about it than, you know, repressed Ohio Catholic. <laughs> and everyone I talk to about this in preparing the speech pretty much agrees with me. Like, kids need basic facts from their parents. That's very important. So now that you know that I know nothing about this, you'll understand that what I'm about to say is not a how-to. <laughs> it's more of a, this is what I'm going to try. <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to try, the first part of my plan, is that I need to use complete sentences. I'm OK with nouns. I can call a penis a penis. I can call a vagina a vagina. But when I need to use verbs to describe what a penis does, <laughs> or use any sort of adjective to describe like what sex is like, I choke up. And I need to get better about that, because it's incomplete information. <laughs> 
I want to be honest and helpful and age appropriate. And luckily, my husband's really good at this because when my eight-year-old son asked him, why does my penis sometimes get taller and wider? Matt said, it's because of blood. (laughs) Blood gets in there and then it can't get out very fast. And that was a really good answer for now. (laughs) This, I think, is the most important piece. I want my kids to understand that sex is physical, but it's also really emotional, and that you're often physically ready before you really have the adult emotional depth you need to process the feelings, and both things should really be in place before you start fooling around. (laughs) And this last piece, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to do this all the time, because I could screw it up like my mother that one time, and if I do it more than once, I'll have a better chance to redeem my myself. I'm open to advice and suggestions. Wish me luck and thank you very much. (laughs) Yay, that was very good. I think being uncomfortable suits her, don't you? That was very good. Anyway, you don't have to teach your kids about sex. My advice is just give them a computer. Or not. Okay.